And we are here with the SCA Coaches Corner. How is everybody doing tonight? Well, thank you. Lovely. Thank All right. Beth. Franos, how are you doing over there? Uh, not too bad. I'm just uh, have a out. little bit of speed stuff going on with mine and hanging out. And uh, hopefully I'll come in uh, uh, decently. I, I do have some connection issues. So All right. Well, everyone know. That is the name of the game, it seems like, for this new way of doing things. And we are going to just go ahead and get started tonight. Um, I am going to pass this off to Tristan, if you don't mind giving us a little overview of what's going to be happening, what people can expect, and who all is involved. Sure thing. Uh, one of the, as we looked at the first episodes to do for Coach's Corner, we came up, we tried to hit some of the things that would be the most popular uh, subjects that people would want to hear about. And one that always comes to mind is speed. How do I be faster? If I can't build my own speed, how do I deal with a fighter who's faster than I am? Uh, it just seems like the, the one overwhelming factor that people think of, like they always want to be quicker. They always want to hit faster. They always want to be able to move faster. And it's one of those things where you can be a successful fighter if you are not faster than your opponent. But yet we always pursue that speed. So this is something, <clears throat> excuse me, that I wanted to put in, I think, in those first few episodes that I think was going to be really important. And when I thought about that, I really thought about Ron Walder, and I really wanted him to be part of this episode because he's one of those fighters that when you face him, you feel like you got outsped, like he's really fast. But when you look at how he moves, he is very thoughtful. He's very calculating. He's his hand speed and, and actual speed is not quick. His timing is impeccable. And that's one of the things I wanted to cover in this episode, which is the difference between outright blazing speed and then timing. So that's kind of what we're going to cover is a number of those things. And we've set up kind of some basic questions that a lot of people have about how do I get to be faster? How do I appreciate my own speed? Like, what am I fast at? What am I not fast at? And I know Bronis and Rongwald are both trained people a great deal in how to deal with people that are faster than you are. And I I've, I've fell, fell into this trap myself. I was uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, I started fighting SCA in 1983. I was knighted in 96 and I fell into the same trap. Uh, I wanted to be quicker than everybody. I thought, boy, if I'm just faster than everybody else, uh, that's going to be great. And, and, and I will be a formidable fighter because I'm just got faster hand speed than everybody, faster foot speed. But I found that it was a trap and unfortunately I found it early enough that I didn't totally get drawn all the way down that path only to find, Oh gosh, well, I grew older and now I'm not fast anymore. Um, so there's, there's a lot to this and, and we may actually wind up splitting this into two episodes, depending on how long it goes as we were crafting this. If we're not episodes. fast enough. Oh uh, yeah, go ahead. If we're not fast enough. Right. <laughs> if we're not fast enough. Right. Um, as we were crafting these, these are kind of open-ended conversations and discussions on these topics. And I want to let everybody know, uh, this topic of speed, really, we don't want to cut anything short or miss anything important in terms of information, but we also want to try to keep these episodes within about an hour to an hour and a half. So if we're really going to go long, we may cut this episode short and pick it up in a following uh, episode. Uh, just because we want to answer people's questions, we want to get them covered and whatnot. So that's kind of what we're going to cover. And we just ask that if you do have questions, try to keep them on topic to the topic of speed and timing and kind of what we're talking about. So that's what I, I can think of. I, I think on, on, I think on that note, what we'll do is make sure that um, coaches corner is out there and Facebook um, SCA coaches corner. If, if we will post uh, something up there along with the tag to the YouTube, to, you can review this again, but if you have questions, please put them in there and, uh, We'll also drop some links and, and some other fun stuff in there that people can review. I got a couple of videos uh, that show some really uh, uh, interesting ways that people show different timing and things like that. So uh, we're going to kind of carry that on there a little bit after we're done uh, over the weekend. And uh, I'd love to see what people uh, uh, have to say. Uh, and if, if other conversations get generated out of that, that would be great. I know that we've had a lot of feedback and uh, what's been great is we got about 35 more uh, conversations that are kind of uh, listed out uh, in our spreadsheet that we'd still like to cover. So um, we got a lot of good stuff coming up for you guys. Uh, but today we are lucky to uh, be able to cover 
the speed topic that Tristan was talking about, and I think we'll uh, we'll we'll start with uh, a little background on our guest, and that is Duke Rongold. He happens to be the slowest man I know, and <laughs> because I have to I have to fight. I've fought him for thirty plus years, yeah. twice a week, and uh, you can look at him. There's there's tears in his eyes because this is the first time I've not seen him fight. And when I say fight, and we, we had a conversation about there, we fight twice a week. If we miss a week in the last 30 years, that's pretty amazing. Uh, even uh, even when we've been hurt, I've seen Ron Galder sitting his great sitting chairs when his knees are hurt. I've seen uh, I've seen him fight right handed when he can't carry anything in his left. Um, this is that part of dedication that 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 the one thing that makes people great and probably the hardest part about fighting in general. So. Uh, thank you for joining us, Ron Galder. I was really hoping you would. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is a, uh, sounds like a fun one to be part of. To everybody listening, uh, to reiterate something that the guys are constantly saying, don't hesitate to put in your questions. Um, every time I've seen them in the previous episodes, uh, they've really fueled the conversation. So don't hesitate to do so. Excellent. For myself, I've been king of the mid-realm three times. I authorized in 1990. And like Brana says... We've been fighting about twice a week since 1990. Uh, and this uh, COVID issue is the first time I've gone more than a month, much less two months without fighting. So uh, it's a pleasure to be able to sit down with good friends and talk about the subject that we all love so dear. So I'm excited to see where this goes. We're great to it's great to have you around, Walter. Thank you. Thank you, Tristan. So that brings us to our first question of the night. Uh, the question being, is being faster than your opponent always better? Hmm, who's going to spearhead this one? Do you want Rob me to take it? Yeah, you're the guy. You're right. Right. Okay, so that's you're cool. Good. You, you get the head cool. off first. <laughs> that's cool. I'm all for that. Um, s speed is an asset. So as you hear me talk, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to sound like the speed is not useful and that's not true uh having speed is an absolute asset but it's like any other skill that we bring to the field if you are simply fast you're, you're not going to get anywhere uh and the reason for that is the only time it works i see is when you get two opponents who want to what i call quick draw those are the people who get into range and see who can fire shots faster more shots or faster uh, an analogy I used to use was if you use a machine gun, you put enough bullets down range, you're bound to hit something. The thing is, you don't know when you're going to hit or what you're going to hit. So, um, again, I like to use a lot of analogies. Uh, another favorite is if you think about something like drag racing, okay, that's perfect because speed is what matters the most, right? You start at the same location, you go to the same destination, fastest person wins. There are some, some correlations to what we do. When we fight there is this you need to get to a spot but the thing is you can dictate what that spot is what that direction is and who starts the race when okay so that's what i attempt to do uh, we have a gentleman in our area we have a few who well, actually most are faster than i am um but i have found that i can beat them the reason i can do it though is i cannot outshoot them what I can do is I can decide when they start to throw, when they start an action. I can decide what direction they're going to go. And then I can simply start and end when I feel like it. So I don't know if that makes sense. It does. It's, it's the difference between speed and timing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and if there's one thing that being, I remember my younger days when I thought, Boy, speed is everything. If you were just so fast that you could outspeed somebody's defense or outspeed somebody's offense, that you would have you would have all the cards. Like every advantage would be yours, and that was true until I found somebody who had good timing. Then it crumbled, and and when you're facing you know mid-level fighters or below, that blazing speed will do you do well for you all day long. But where it starts to fall down is when you have somebody that understands positioning. He understands timing, understands pace, control. And the one thing I wanted to jump in with, too, is that there's a price for speed. You, it, it doesn't come free or easy. And where I found this 
uh, just as background, I live in Minnesota. We're in a northern climates here, pretty cool generally. And when the temperatures are, are cool, no problem. You can, you can go to use speed. Then when you go south, and when I, the first time I really ran into this was when I went to Lily's War, where it was uh, you know, Missouri in, the, in June. So it was 100 degrees, about 98% humidity. Their speed, you have it for about three seconds, and then you don't have it anymore. Like it's gone. You're so exhausted that you just do not have the ability to be fast for more than just a short period of time. And so one of the big things I found out, learned the hard way was energy management is being fast requires a high level of energy. And that's where I've always watched and studied Rongwalder. His energy management is impeccable. Like he can, he can fight longer than fast guys can fight. And when, when they run out of gas, he's there waiting for them. And it's going to all, all over in a matter of seconds by that point. And so energy management is a huge part. And it's one of the things I wanted to bring into this, this discussion too. And maybe Bronis, you have something to say about that too. So, you know, having fought Ron Galder for, for all the years, um, I, I am, I'm lucky enough to understand uh, uh, his speed. And he's lucky enough to understand my speed. And uh, there's a constant fight. Um, I'm, not, I'm not slow by any means. Um, I probably started out faster and I guarantee you with time we all get slower um, but uh, you know the, the the big piece is we know exactly each other's timing and the fight really isn't about speed the, the fight is who outsmarts each other mm -hmm. and uh, that becomes the, the, the thing you see the most um, we uh, we were lucky enough to have uh, Duke Rurik uh, come and uh, when he was an unbelt and probably one of the fastest people I've ever seen um and uh, shortly after a couple months after he was here um we looked at him and said you know what i'm gonna do for you i am gonna teach you how to be slow uh and and, and he looked at us like uh what do you mean and and you know what we meant at that point was live by speed die by speed if you can't change tempo in your fight mm -hmm if you can't create what you want in the speed that you need it, be it slow or fast, then you're a one trick pony. And you know, that's that live by speed, die by speed. Somebody starts understanding your speed. No big deal. I know exactly what to do when you can modulate that speed and, and turn something from slow to fast. And this is what Ron Galder actually does the far better than I do. Um, you know, it, it, it's, that's where you can start picking apart the times that you need and know that person, what that person is doing. Um, so speed is a, is a real interesting topic. And like Ron Gruller said, speed is still, it is an asset to, 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 to kind of use, uh, but it, it isn't, you know, the one tool in the box that works for everything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wonderful. Um, unless you would like to expand on that any further, anybody? Do, do we have any questions uh, so far? On... As of right now, we do not. Okay, okay. then I will uh, expound sure. if I may. Mm -hmm. So I've used some analogies, but an analogies are really just there to help convince you of my point. What I'd rather do now is try to explain how, how a slower person like me is beating a person who is significantly faster. Um, I, th the first step is not to put my speed against theirs. The second is I need to understand what a person does, what my opponent does, how fast they really are. So it is common for me to faint or bait and then take that bait away. I look for the things that make them want to swing and attack. And those movements and those attacks uh, will give me insight into what their actual speed is. So what that tells me is I've learned what it takes to make them start the race and how long it's going to take them to finish the race. Okay. So once I know that, then I can choose when to make them start the race. In other words, start their fast shot. And I can either pick up on what they're doing before they start the race and fire before they fire. I can know their timing, get them to throw a commit a weapon and fire in the middle of their shot because now the weapon is committed to someplace that I've chosen. 
or I can bait, let them fire, and either absorb the shot, dodge the shot, or fire back. And I can do all that because I know when they're going to do their thing. I know when it's going to start. I know how long it's going to take. I know when it's going to end. So all I need to do is start my timing at a point where the action I want to take in response to them happens at the same time. And sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's slower. So that's a fairly simple way. Does that, does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, it does. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. I, and, and I see it all the time. Uh, you know, we have a, uh, you know, it's great strong brothers fought in a lot of heroics for a very long time at Penzik. Um, and, uh, and it's funny because he'll come back at the sideline and, you know, usually after killing somebody and I'll like, I'll give him a big yawn. <laughs> you're gonna, you're gonna do something different because, you know, <laughs> we, we talk about this, uh, and maybe it's not directly related to speed, but it is directly related to how you build that fight using speed or, or really using that change of speed to create what you need. And that is, he is so good and, and most top fighters have a couple of shots that are, are their bread and butters. Usually if you look in boxing, kickboxing, they have two or three shots, Mike Tyson, Muhammad Ali, all of these guys. Uh, and, uh, and everybody knows what they are, but nobody can block them. Right. And, and because sometimes they, you know, they'll, they know all the other shots and they'll give you fakes and they'll do all these things, but they're setting you up. And sometimes they set you up by throwing a fast punch and then changing the speed on that punch to be slightly slower. Mm -hmm. Because what, what happens is that creates actually a little doubt in people's mind, or they'll throw something a little bit slower and then change that speed on the next one. Mm -hmm. You know, that first shot comes out at, 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 uh, at a normal rate. And then at the, the, if they'll get that second, you know, double jab will come in faster the second time because they're a little closer to their opponent. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the idea of taking what you know, well, and then changing the speed on those things, you know, well, and positioning to create what you want. Uh, you know, I've you know, heard that too, described as set the rhythm and then break the rhythm. Yeah. And I, I call it like, we do a lot of tempo work, uh, including, uh, back and forth, you know, a lot of gr- foot tempo work. So I'll, I'll start up real fast and I'll slow the pace and I'll go faster again. So you're breaking up and down inside a tempo. So your opponent can't stay in the same. I, I talk about that a lot in, uh, in, we refer to it in running. Uh, and you know, you, you kind of set a pace, everybody sets a pace, but sometimes what you want to do is tear break somebody down. So you, you set a pace and then you, 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 uh, somebody's tracking you, you build that pace. And you're, you know what that pace is. So you know you how long them you can into it. You got it. And now they're wanting to keeping up. So now they're trying to keep your pace. They're not in control, really. And then as soon as you know that, okay, I'm going to slow it down, you slow it down slow enough that the other guy doesn't know you slowed it down yet mm-hmm. until he's almost past you. And then he's like, oh, damn, I, I, now I'm over my pace. I, you know, this guy totally, he, I can't stay at this pace without breaking down. And then he'll start slowing down and then you pick it back up. And he never has time to fundamentally recover. So it makes it very difficult. When the same thing's happening with the idea of, of tempo or pace, uh, and that includes with shots. Uh, you, can, you can set up really fast feet and make you look real fast, and then you slow down for a sec and just throw a slow shot, and that person's totally off his pace. And uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting to be able to change those dynamics because it's such a huge part of fighting. Uh, and, and we don't talk about it a lot. Uh, they talk about a little bit more in the upper ranks of like boxing and things. Um, uh, but you know, things like tension will also allow you to change somebody else's pace. If I want somebody to be slower, I'll put more tension in them. And what I mean by that is I'll, I'll get them into a threatening zone build that tension in her body and their body will reduce their speed by, by itself because the tension in her, they have to give that tension up in their body to relax the muscles, to move again. That's the price for speed. They, there you they go. They pay a big price for trying to go that fast and have that much tension. Exactly. So, so, you know, there's ways to control some of that. Uh, and uh, you know, that, that comes back to the, the most dangerous guy in the room is you know, the, the, the guy that's sitting in the corner, most relaxed, right? 
<laughs> because uh, you know, if, if if everybody's you know uptight and in tension, that that guy relaxed is is you know he can be the fastest guy in the room at any second, you know, and uh, where everyone else has to has to bring that down for a second to change their position because their muscles are already in tension. Now there's a certain there's a certain uh, allowment of tension. You can't be all the way down because there's actually too low in tension. You mm-hmm. you 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 have to bring it up to actually get to a point where you're doing. But you want to be in this low edge tension where you're relaxed but ready, and that's how you that's how you build. If, you know, in in a lot of cases, people lose speed because they hold that tension in their hands, holding the sword, gripping it really hard, or they'll hold it in their their body, they'll hold it in their breath. And and we you know this is another conversation we'll have some other time. But they'll hold they'll hold their breath while they're throwing something. You know, we right. in martial arts, you and and. Tristan, you can talk more about this. We mm-hmm. use the kia to release that tension from your body, which also releases the energy from your body. Sure. And that allows that flow to, to happen all at once. So if you want to talk about that, I mean, I'm yeah, sure you probably it, have it, more it of an does. insight. You know, there's some doctrine about, about uh, even some sport martial arts that use, uh, for example, kendo where if you strike, yeah. land a strike without a ki, you do not get a point for it mm-hmm. within their competition. So that ki is part of the, the, that energy expenditure when it comes to an actual strike. And um, now I'm not a kendo expert or anything like that, but you can tell that the, there is a combination with combining your breath and your expenditure in that one burst where you need that one strike to happen. But I think what you talk about with tension you can't have that level of tension all the time. You will just exhaust yourself. And I remember a, a conversation that, that Brunus, you and I had many, many years ago, and, and this shown a, a great light on how much I was trying to use high level of tension, and high level of speed. And I remember uh, having that problem of, because I was going so fast all the time, I felt like I was trying to push that 100% of my speed constantly. And I remember within our conversation, you said, try going down to 80% and just stay at 80%. Calm yourself down. Don't scramble and try to rush anything. Just stay at that 80% level. And then when you see that one moment, jump up to 100% and use your speed and then come right back down to 80%. And I felt that that was like it opened a door for a whole different way to look at how to relax the tension, control the pace, and, and I found that I could ramp people up into them going hundred percent, but then I go 80%. But the more, and I found that the more that I did that, I would, I would look at my opponent and be like, keep burning your energy up. I'm relaxing. One of us is going to be in real trouble here in about two, three, four or five minutes. And that I found that to be a universal. Yeah. And I think the other piece is you're holding tension is in his body. So what's happening is his shots he has to release and it's easy if you mm-hmm. if you can have good connection with your opponents it's easy to see that release very so much he has so. to release before going into a shot so mm-hmm. even though the sword speed may be fast there's a lot of tells on the front end very much so so wrong well there would you, you can agree feel on that energy and i remember yes. in the, the cornet tournament that i that i i eventually won going into the finals I was over at the edge of the field and I was thinking, okay, I know what happens next. You know, we go and present our consorts to the, to the sovereign. And, you know, so I'm over kind of brushing my hair because I had long hair at the time. And I look over to the other side of the field and my opponent's pacing back and forth like a tiger in a cage. And I could tell right where his energy level was Mm -hmm. and where his mind was and where mine was. I was relaxed and comfortable and he was nervous and pacing. And, and I don't think he had any mind of what was about to happen next or the fact there was going to be 10 minute, minutes worth of heralds and, and protocol and circumstance and all the you know, pomp and whatnot was going on. He was thinking, oh, my God, you know, we're going to fight. We're going to fight. And kind of like you and Rangvalder, he and I were from the same practice group. So, you know, we had an established history there. But when I looked over and I saw that he was nervous and I was calm, I knew exactly what was going to happen next. Like there was really very little mystery left, um, but it was, it all had to do with the energy level and the tension level. And I think that was a, a great lesson that it took several years for me to learn to understand. It's hard to talk about speed. Cause I know that's what we're trying to focus on, yes, yeah. but it's difficult to do that without talking about these other factors of the fight. 
Yeah. Uh, I think that's a big lesson for people to take away from this. Those who are saying, I need to be faster, I need speed, that way of looking at your fighting is risky no matter what thing you're trying to work on. I really need to have better feet. I really need to make better weapons. I don't care what it is. If you think you got one thing to fix and it's going to make everything better, it's not. There's all this stuff that has to be kept up. Um, right now, what we're talking about is tension. And what I'm hearing in that, it's relationship to speed. Those who want to be faster or like me, just never, I'll never be faster. Um, I get that. And I'm totally cool with that. Um, the tension that these other two are talking about is a way for those of us who are slower to sort of be faster because really what we're asking is we don't, we're, we don't want to have great speed. We just want to be faster than the other guy. And one way to do that is make him slower. Mm -hmm. So if you can, a person who is tense, throws slower their muscles are, won't react because they're all tense they have to fight themselves to make a motion um it's the same thing with a uh, with like a stronger person it's the same kind of an issue uh or somebody who's very energetic so uh like the tension that Brownis is talking about we will sometimes use that word in reference not just to their body's tension but their mental tension can you get someone so excited that they just they just gotta throw Okay, that sometimes makes them faster, but it makes them very reactionary. And going back to what I was saying before, if I know what a person's timing is and they are instinctively energetic, I will often bring their energy up because now they just, they just want to go. And now I have an opponent who's not thinking is running at a speed with which I can time. And now the fast guy becomes easy. Now I'm the guy who seems faster. Right. Yeah, in it's fact, uh, yeah, well, yes. and even... On his note, uh, you know, it's funny because we we smile at each other all the time, um, <laughs> because he'll come off the field and and uh, and and you'll hear it and you'll hear it from even great people. They're like, "Man, Rongvalder's so fast," and we laugh. You know, it's the the trick is he's fast because he got you to throw a blow and he started a half hour earlier. You know, he, <laughs> he, he, you had no clue, but he started way before you. And as you're going out to throw that, the, your arms going out, he's hitting it because he knew where it was going to be. You know, and this makes me want to jump in with one point, and that is that speed, fast speed, allows you to make up for bad timing. If you start late, yeah. if you're fast, you can catch up with how you should have started originally, but you didn't. But when you finally notice it, then you do, and you can, you can use speed to catch up. So I think speed, if anything, is, can be a crutch more than anything else. That's a up, really good point, Tristan. Make up for poor timing. Yeah, that's a that's an awesome point. Uh, using maybe people need to look at themselves when they're asking that question. Man, I really need. I'm just not fast enough. You know what? I'll bet money there's probably something else you're doing. Um, the ones I see now that you bring that up, when I see others who try to throw faster, of course, all they result in is throwing harder, mm -hmm. typically, right? Um, but the reason they need to throw faster is, is to try to make up for some deficiency. And usually it's a telegraph. They're doing some motion that lets me know. Sometimes I have had opponents as much as two to three seconds ahead of time, tell me what they're going to do. And I'm like, I, I, I already know the fight's going to happen. I can tell you the next five seconds. I already know. And I've done it to people when I'm teaching them in class, in, in, uh, in practice. I can see them doing it so much. I go, you're going to thrust. And they're like, what? That's like your mind reading. I'm not mind reading anything. You just told me. You literally showed me what you were going to do. And then you're going to do it three seconds later and expect that I'm going to allow it. So, of course, I look fast. You gave me a three-second warning. And with my creepy old man timing, I'm got all the time in the world with that. I love that. Creepy old man timing. <laughs> <laughs> That's rich. <laughs> Oh, so, so if you're asking yourself, ah, I'm just not fast enough, I will bet you money there's something in technique that you could tighten up hmm. um, and, and change in, your in, your, in how you move. I have, because I don't have that speed, um, I have had to make sure that my mechanics are on point. 
everything's right where it belongs. And when I throw a shot, the weapon travels straight towards where I want it to go. And the weapon doesn't commit until I'm halfway into a shot. So hopefully the person doesn't know what's coming. And I have a little more time to change direction if I need to. And but I if I'm good, go I was gonna say, but if I'm doing the opposite, if I'm and, and Browse will tell you this too, because it's it's a problem I went through a few, uh, what was it, what's it now, two, three years ago, I had a problem where I had to stop and unlearn and rebuild. And one of the issues I had was I was not throwing properly. And part of that was this little loop with the tip of my weapon. And all of a sudden, my timing's way off. Well, it's not because I didn't have enough speed. It was because I was telling everybody ahead of time and everybody was picking up my shots. You were wasting motion. Yeah, I was. And looking oh, back on it, I, yes, yep. And we picked it up fairly quick and then there was yeah. the correction period but looking back on it there was a moment where i was like wow i've lost some whatever speed i had it's gone mm. i hadn't lost any speed i was just yeah. now i was the guy going hey here comes my shot right <laughs> you know and then i and then i was incredulous that they blocked it like, well that's just ridiculous how do they block my shot well mm. i told them yeah so i think i think that jumps into the the other topic and I, we've been talking a little bit tension and about speed but you know let's let's for those people that do want to maybe get faster or at least be perceived as faster because rumble is perceived as fast all the time and he'll sit here and i'll sit here and tell you he's not um but you know you walk off the field it's like oh my god he threw faster than you know i've ever seen anything i didn't even see it coming and the key is perception and and so if you really want the first step in throwing fast uh, one is watch your tension in your body. And, and then the next step is, uh, the trying to reduce the amount of tell and, and the direction to the, the kind of the, the, the timing your opponent can pick up. In other words, if I take a, if I'm closing an opponent and I take a step first, they see it because perception allows your eyes to see that foot move mm -hmm. if i lean into them without moving my feet i'm going directly at them and you just never know how close you end up being because perception doesn't change nearly as fast when you're coming directly at someone mm -hmm. you know so that hand's coming right at you you don't know until very end because uh, i i related to and i always talked about this as the the guy standing on a railroad track that train doesn't look like it's going very fast mm -hmm. because it's coming directly at you and there's no, there's no lines of perception changing. You go to the side and you're like, whoo, that, that train's going okay, right? Uh, so that same thing can happen with a sword. And I don't care if you're, you're stick, you know, they, they have the stick on the shoulder where you're kind of flashlighting it and then flick it at the end. You know, whatever you're doing to, to cover what your tell is, is what's happening, your, your opponent is getting to see it change at the very end of the blow instead of the beginning. Mm -hmm. So if I start immediately and and I roll that top of the stick out, I see it because it's a perception change way up here. It's like, hey, I'm waving at you, right? But if I'm here and I go this, all of a sudden, you don't get to see that same change. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not that you're faster, but in your opponent's mind, he only gets a, he gets a lot less time to react with a block because he's seeing it much later in the blow. Do you guys have some comments about that? One of the things that, that leaped to mind is, as you were talking about that is some of the telegraphs and, and I've seen and even been guilty of this myself in the, in the past, which was I would give a telegraph of, I'd take a deep breath and then I'd fire. And so it was such a blatant, stupid telegraph. And I'm talking, I might as well have sent my opponent a letter mm -hmm. and said, here, I'm going to set, I'm going to throw a shot in 24 hours later, there it comes. So we can have a lot of different telegraphs that are not necessarily related to our sword movement, whether you talk about foot movement or whether you take a breath or, or something else happens, you raise a shoulder, you lower your shoulders. All of these things can be tells that you can be doing without even noticing them. And this is where I think when you get in a good practice group of people that want to see you be better, they'll tell you about it. Like I I'm every time you do this, I know you're about to throw a shot. And if you get in a group like that, or you create a group where you're trying to get, make each other better, 
rather than trying to compete with one another, you're actually going to tell one another, hey, listen, you're telling me you're going to throw a shot. So you got to kind of hide it. And this is where I, I really like that video we've been uh, we put around in Coach's Corner right from the from the beginning, which is Michael J. White talking about yeah. how to hide that shoulder movement to throw that initial punch. And because people look at the body, they look at the big thing in front of them. And SCA fighters do this all over the place. They watch, they watch that body movement. They can, they can see a deep breath coming in and out. They can, even without knowing what they're looking for, they see those things. And so if you, if you show those before you, you fire your shot, you're just going to give them an indication of what's about to happen, or maybe not what's about to happen, but that something is about to happen. And as we know, if you back up about three or four inches, no matter what's about to happen, you'll usually foil it. So that's what I've noticed about different types of tells that are not related to the hands moving or the feet moving or the mechanics of a shot. It's just the setup of what you do before that shot happens. A method that I've used, uh, I got lucky to, I don't even remember if I was pointed out or I stumbled on it because it was so early. Brian, if you remember back in the church when we only fought up on that uh, stage, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. We had, uh, we had all the space, but because of issues, we could only use the small space. So we tended to run like little bear pits. So it's really common, bear pit, bear pit, bear So, of course, in a bear pit, there's two people fighting and the, whoever else is there is just standing in line, right? I realized sometime maybe what maybe three years in two three years in when i was first figuring out how to read people that if you're not fighting and you're the one standing in line waiting your turn waiting your turn in a tournament waiting for somebody else to come fight you at a pickup or a practice if you really want to learn that time is can be wasted sitting around Study. Or it can be used to watch an opponent. Learning to read an opponent can be done in a fight, in your practice fights and in your tournaments. But of course, somebody's trying to hit you at the same time. So it's going to be slow process. Maybe this is a, and then you get hit. It's like, okay, well, I didn't learn anything from that. What I found was watching from the outside, I would sort of, the way, the way it felt was I was running like a videotape that only ran for about, three to five seconds. So what I would do is when somebody would do a thing, throw a shot, make some kind of motion, whatever thing it was, I'd stop for a second and sort of mentally replay. What did they do just before that? And now I'd watch for that thing and see if they did it and followed it with the thing that I saw them do. Let's say the thing is throwing a shot, whatever shot, let's say it's a flat snap, right? Maybe that person, his happens to be a little shoulder drop that he does just before he fires it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But he's really fast and that's our issue, right? So you got this guy who fires this really fast flat snap shot, but if you watch him from the side, I, you will eventually see what he does just before he fires that flat snap. He'll do a thing. So now that flat snap, which was taking fractions of a section, a second, is now, in your mind, taking upwards of a second to be thrown. And you've got, you'll find you've got all the time in the world to pick it up. When you know what to look for. When you know what to look for. So if you want to learn, the, the pract- one of the practical ways of learning to read people is to watch from the sidelines. Pick one person, watch them, and, and figure out what it is they're doing before they throw a shot, before they do whatever. They'll tell you. And then I think coming right back, uh, right back from that and and really kind of driving to, we're talking about speed here, but, uh, and and it's, you know, that's a personal thing. You get something you can practice and we're going to kind of cover that a little bit more, but we're also, if you recognize those things, this is an education and, and pass that on because anybody can be a coach. Anybody can be a trainer, right? All you have to do is make sure that the person that you're helping wants to listen. So the, the idea there is find if you have people that are going to you and trying to, and trying to, uh, that, that they're looking for help, they trust you and they want that help. And, and this is, you know, we're here to try to give you information so that you can help them. And if that means you have to become a better watcher, like is Grace Rongvalder just said, then Maybe you have to be a better watcher. I mean, even now, after 30 years of, of coaching people and training people uh, all over the place, uh, just in the last year, I've 
changed so much in, and I've learned so much about training. And every time I sit through one of these, uh, between Sean and Tristan and his grace, Eliyahu, uh, you know, I, I sit back and I'm like, Ooh, I should just sit here and, and listen to like everyone else. I'm learning so much. So, um, this is the opportunity for all of us to be better and, and help each other because in, in really in the end, I think that's what everybody wants. Cause if you help somebody else reason, you know, I was around a good, uh, you know, probably what, wrong color two years before really you started fighting, fighting. Uh, you were, well, you were, yeah, that's, that'd be about right. Cause you united yeah. in 93, I believe. Yeah, that's right. And I authorized so, in like 90. Yeah. So, you know, it, but what happened is, you know, and we had a pretty small practice and Ron Waller can talk about that. And, you know, we grew it and, and, you know, my piece was, is I trained everyone I could to be better than me constantly. I'd be like, you know how I'm hitting you? This is how I'm hitting you. So this is our opportunity to help each other. And if that's, Hey, you want to be faster than you physically, I can't make you faster. There's some tools you can throw in there, but really fast twitch muscle tissue and, and tendon stuff is hard to make work. It's the mind is, is probably a lot more about how you deliver stuff on making stuff faster. It's how your mind reacts. Um, but you can say, well, you're, you're rolling like wrong said, you're rolling the top of your sword. You know, this is, this is something that me and wrong there do all the, to each other all the time. Uh, you know, we, he, he talked about that story and, and he, you know, he looked and he's like, what am I doing? And I'm like, well, you've got a loop in the top of your sword. And he's like, Oh, okay. And then, you know, two weeks later, he's great again, and I hate him. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it, you know, and then and then he look at me, he's like, hey, 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 your foot is one inch too, 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 too turned out. And I'm like, oh, you're killing me. <laughs> so I go back and fix that. Yep. Then I hate him. <laughs> so just, just beware. We're here to help each other. And if you really want to be great, l learn to be a good coach and trainer. Learn these things. Listen to it everyone i've been listening to lots of stuff and it's all out there right now it's been great i was listening to some some folks from calentier the other day that uh we're talking about a lot of things i talk about in a little bit more of a fundamental layer but it was so good to listen to at that fresh uh layer that's easy to understand and uh but l listen and and take it in if it doesn't work for you that's fine but take it in and try to see what it might work for somebody else so, you know if i could jump into there i've taken that same attitude with people in my dojo I want my students to be as good or better than I am at the Aikido that I teach them. I want us to be a peer group where we can challenge each other because I've seen the value in what happens when you have people that are challenging each other to become better. Like the rising tide raises all the ships. And so once that happens, you have a kind of a magical group. And this is one of the other episodes that I wanted to cover on this, which is making a uh, what they call a talent hotbed or a group of people that are going to make all everybody within that group better. They're all going to rise together because they not only challenge each other, but they help each other improve. And, and I think that's one of those important things that it's not about having one big shot guy that tells everybody else what to do. It's about a group of people that are mutually trying to get the best out of each other. And when that happens, you get, you just get a, an incredible learning environment. Yeah. And it's, it's vibrant and active. It's fun to be part of. It's got such a great energy. There's, there's nothing better than that. All right. So um, let's reel it back in for a second. I, since I'm took, I took it off the edge there for a second. I apologize. Thank you, Tristan. Sure. Um, and I think we actually have uh, Tristan that we talked about, we have an episode on how to create a practice like that, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to pull some other yep. people in that have created incredible practices. So mm -hmm. we'll post that episode as people can get back to practice and, Yep. so that the timing works well for everybody but Absolutely. back back to speed a little bit we can help people be faster and i guess you know and i'm going to ask a question um and i'll have an answer i'll, I'll, I'll bring mine later because i've been working on new some new training techniques if somebody said they wanted to be faster and 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 you thought well i think i can help them uh, what would be the first things you look and try to help them with and we'll start with with this grace rongo i'd look for um what kind of body position they're doing are they relaxing in the tells like we talked about are they giving tells when they are throwing um so i think the first place i would start would be body mechanics 
So uh, using my own, because it's the one I'm most familiar with, I make sure that my hip, uh, hip, hand, shoulder, those three are all lined up when I move. Um, and when I move, uh, like Bronze has overheard me say, I always tell, everybody's like, you, they tell me I move a lot. And I, I, the way I like to put it is, I don't move at all. You should never move. You should put your stance in a new location. It's very, very different. So if you're trying to move, we've all seen people walk around and then get in stance. While they're walking around, they're useless. You need to be in stance. While I'm moving in stance, that, that foot, hip, shoulder, hand, that whole section is all lined up. So when I'm ready to throw a shot, whether it be something suddenly is appearing or something I've set up, that shot will travel the shortest distance to its target. The gun is loaded, it is cocked, it's pointed. All that's left is pulling a trigger. That's all I have left. And I find if I fail in a shot, in other words, I throw something I felt should have been good, but it gets blocked, I typically will replay my body mechanics. And almost every single time a foot is out, my tip faded out, my hand was low. It was one of those things was not in line. I did not have everything lined up. Just like dominoes, if you line them all up and one of them's out of place, they will not fall. You want all your dominoes lined up. And if they're not, you shouldn't be throwing the shot. Get out. That's a good description. Uh, one of the things that, that I guess I would approach is, is and I sent Bronis an article about this, and I'll, I'll post this up in the, in the, uh, when I put this on YouTube and, and whatnot. It's an article about the five aspects of speed. And when, if somebody came to me and said, hey, I want to be faster, really what I do is say, let's identify what aspects of you are fast and what aspects are not. What's the, the impediment here? And that is the, the article mentions these five aspects of speed. And the first one is perception speed. How fast does your mind pick up that there's something going on? Because if that's slow and your hand speed is fast, you, that's going to be a whole different problem to solve than if you your mind can see what's happening, but your execution speed is slow. So there are these five different aspects, I think, really helped me in terms of helping students troubleshoot where they were encountering the, the slow problem uh, or where they were encountering uh, the speed that they needed to improve because different these different categories really need totally different solutions for how you overcome them. The first one is perception speed. The second one is how quick is your mind to take the perception that you just saw and make a good decision and then execute it. So all of that is mental. It has nothing to do with, with physical muscle or anything like that. Both of those are, are mental. So processing one, speed. Processing speed, exactly. The third one is initiation speed. Once your brain decides to act, does your body follow its instruction quickly? That one can, can fail where the rest of them are, are good, and that can be the, the source of your problem. The fourth one, and the one that everybody thinks of, is performance speed. Like, how fast does my body execute when I say I need to go? And so they, they start doing plyometric push-ups or plyometric exercises for explosiveness. Well, if their perception speed or their mental decision speed or their initiation speed are slow, they can do all the fast muscle exercises in the world and never overcome the problem that it's a processing issue. The last one is alteration speed. So you, you've started an action, but you need to change it. If your alteration speed is slow, you cannot make any adaption after you've chosen the action that you've done. So with these five different things, five different aspects of speed, really what you need to do is audit your own body and, and how you fight to reflect on, all right, which are the ones need improvement? Where am I, where am I weak? Where am I strong? One of the innovators in this right now in terms of the training space is Vasil Lomachenko, who's exactly. being trained, I think, by his father. And yeah. he's, he's got a, not only amazing speed, but his training regimen is very innovative. He's got up on the wall, and I, and I remember watching a video of some of the ways that he trains his mental speed. And they, they put up grids, five by five grids on the wall with the numbers one through 25 randomly put on them. And he looks at them 
and he, his eyes scan and he will he will reach out and touch one and then two and then three and then four and then five all the way through so he's training himself to look and then reach when his his brain says yes go to that target and they'll take these numbers and they'll put them upside down they'll do reverse they'll do different colors to try to confuse the brain and so what he's doing is a brain exercise to increase perception speed mental decision speed and initiation speed regardless of what the physical muscle tissue will do and he's got a few other exercises that are meant to really uh, enhance the eye hand coordination speed the the speed of the brain to say go and then have his have his hands go to that target without him getting into a ring and sparring with somebody and getting hit in the head like that's a whole different type of of speed and so when you understand these different aspects of speed and execution that start in the brain they start in how your how your signals go from your brain through your nervous system to your body then you can start to say okay where do i need work where where am i strong where am i weak and where can i bring the weak parts up to match what i can do already so there's a lot of innovative training stuff that that is being forged uh that is really as far as we know never been been explored before People just say, well, I guess I've, I've got a slow perception speed. I'm going to have to adapt to being slower. You can build those things. You really can. There's a lot you can do to, to build up. But, and I love the, the fact that, you know, there's fighters like Ron Walder. And one of the other people that has been remarkably skilled in terms of being slower is Duke Havec out of the West. I am absolutely captivated by watching him be slower than his opponents with a tiny little shield and he's tall as all get out, long legs like me, and he can outmove his opponents. Like that, that is a great skill to have. And he has really tuned his fight to his particular traits and his the way his body works. And he's figured out a whole style that works exactly for what he what he's doing in terms of not trying to outspeed his opponent. And uh, I'd love to have him on. I'd love to have him describe his his process, and we're going to get to a lot more people. But when you understand these, there's different aspects of speed, not just one, I can really throw a fast shot. It's, it goes far deeper than that. Uh, I think that's a first step of, of understanding, okay, what happens when I want to become faster? Well, faster in what way exactly? That's a, that's probably one of the, arguably probably one of the most vital things we might get out of this discussion. You've, what you've done is you've clarified what speed is, right? So everybody's coming in here going, I want to be faster. Well, you can and you can't. What are you talking about? What kind of speed are you talking about? And really, when I think when somebody says they want to be faster, they don't, it's not necessarily, hand, hand speed I think is what they're thinking of, mm -hmm. but what they really want is to be simply faster than their opponent, right? They, right. they want to get there sooner, whatever that may be. And I don't, even I have not heard that kind of a clarification, those five steps um, described that way. I've, I've heard of them in pieces um, mm -hmm. and related to other things, but that's, um, I, actually, I'm gonna reiterate them for two reasons, for everybody listening, but also yeah. for myself, <laughs> for myself, so I've got them. So the first one is um, perception. Perception. Right? Yep. Perceptions first, how, how quickly and clearly can you perceive what's going on? Uh, the second is process is processing, correct? Mental or, de or de decision speed. How fast Deci do you decide? Okay. So how fast you make a decision? And then there's initiation, mm -hmm. uh, initiation, which is the actual throwing of the shot. Performance. And, yeah. and that's the performance. And then was... Alteration. Like if alteration. you need to make a modification. Okay. You and you said there were five. That's... Yep. Am I missing one? Uh, perception, decision speed, initiation then performance, then alteration speed. Okay. Those, those are the five. Yep. Okay. So I think those are important. So, and like, like Bronis had said in a more general way, there are different levels to the speed. Now we've got a definition for five different parts of what speed is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now people can look at it and go, okay, th I, these are the ones I can change. Mm -hmm. These are the ones I can alter. Right. So, Bronis is exactly right. Training tw quick twitch muscles is, is a process, a big process. Um, and as we've amply described, I think 
is probably going to get you the least results. Right. You know, talk to a trainer, find the exercises that it takes to become faster mm -hmm. and look how much work you'll have to do. And then listen to what we've been saying and realize all that work may not get you what you want. Sure. You know, now, if I want it to be better than I am, um, unfortunately, I don't like working out, but that's of those, that's my weakest one. Mm. So I have like four out of five, right? Sure. So I'm missing one. I would be better if I had better hand speed. Mm -hmm. I'm just not willing to make the commitment to have that kind of hand speed. Sure. So, you know, there was a time when, when I felt like I was struggling with that decision speed of, okay, I've seen what's happening and now I need to decide and act without hesitation. And funny thing, I just decided to try this on a lark. The way that I decided to train this was, you know, when you go into a restaurant and you, you open up a menu and a lot of people don't remember going into restaurants because we've been locked down <laughs> many restaurants open these days, but you go into a restaurant, you look at the menu, you're like, what am I going to have? And you're like, well, maybe I should have this. Well, maybe I should have that. Well, I don't know. This sounds pretty good too. I just decided outright. I said, you know what? When I open the menu, I've got three seconds. I'm going to scan it. Bam. And that's going to be my choice. That's it. And it, all it did as I did that for about six months, it started to increase the just make a decision and commit to it. Do not hesitate. Don't second guess yourself. Don't sit and, and churn in your brain about, well, maybe this would be better. Or I don't like this. Just make a decision and go. And I found, believe it or not, that process sped up my decision making. And right or wrong, so oftentimes it's better to make a poor decision than to make no decision. So why not decide and just go? Just do it. Just, you know, without beating yourself up and sitting and second guessing yourself, this is a common trap that everybody falls into. And every, everybody does. We've all done it. I really like the five parts. I think that might be a good way to look at this, that instead of looking at it more general, let's, let's look specific. So if we go through them chronologically, the first one is perceptive speed. Mm -hmm. You know, how fast are you picking up what's out there? Um, to me, the first way to work on that is knowledge uh, and experience. And that goes back to what I was talking before. When you are on the sidelines, don't waste that time. Use that time to watch other people fight and practice your perceptive speed. Mm -hmm. How quickly can you pick up what he's doing? Not respond to it, none of that, because you're not even in the fight. Just watch from the outside and work on your perceptive speed. I think that's a great way to do that. Um, you know, I think when they when they talk about poker players, they say if you can't spot the sucker at the table, you're the sucker. Very much so. If you're watching the field and you don't, and you're not watching the other people and studying how they're playing or how or, or how they're fighting, you're the one that's going to be the sucker. When it comes time you walk out there, you'll have no idea what you're walking into. Yeah. Yep. I would agree. I would agree. The, uh, so that's probably my biggest forte is being able to find that information ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So in a way I don't necessarily do it. Well, I guess I do it faster as well. I learned to pick up information. I learned to pick up what people's tells are, what that information is. Mm -hmm. I have learned that sometimes I can create them so I can force them to show what those things are. And that's what became more my forte was how much information can I have them give me? And sometimes I can get people to show me as much as, like I say, a few seconds ahead of time, what they're going to do. So my perceptive speed becomes extremely high and makes up for later on. Um, processing speed. I think you can work on that from outside as well, but now you're starting to talk about inside a fight. Uh, and the reason I say you can work on it from outside is because I can remember when I was doing that standing in line and when I was beginning to read people and I find myself doing it now is I settle down into kind of a half stance where I'm sitting, my hips are tucked under and I'm relaxed while watching a fight. And then I feel the fight, feel where that other person's going. And I read his information and I begin responding to it while watching. So I, I don't know how odd I look if... <laughs> if people watch me when I'm standing on the sidelines, but I know that I've done that where I'm mentally responding to what they're doing. So I'm learning and practicing already how to respond to what they're doing. 
then of course the other part is taking that into a fight. Something I think people need to remember when they're doing practice, the point of practice, we hear this all the time, point of practice is practice. The way that I do that is, if you think of, of a fight as everything brought together, when you are doing something in practice, I don't care what it is, whatever you're doing, first figure out your intent. What's your, what are you practicing? What is the thing? Once you have the thing, you eliminate the rest of the whole fight until you're working on the thing. So if you want to work on this response and you've not worked on it before, then you take someone who does feel fast to you. It doesn't matter who it can be anybody, but that's probably the best. And you have them throw one particular shot. I want you to throw that flat snap. I want you to throw that center line thrust that you throw so well. So move around. We'll, we'll move like say in a fight, but all that person's going to do is when they throw, that's the only shot they're going to throw. So you teach yourself how to pick up the motion on that one shot from one person. And once you get it, then you can start thinking about other shots and other people and other things. And then you will begin to build, uh, I want to say a mental library, but that's not quite right. A mental skill at, at doing that. So now you're applying it in a fight. So I think that's a good way to go to our, to our second one, which is, Decision speed. Yeah. Now our decision speed. So decision speed is a big one where information is important too. You built up this uh, mental experience of what all these different things are uh, and, and, uh, and what's going to be the best choice for you. Then does your hand speed, hand speed. I would, as I said, I don't think I'd, Personally, I don't think I'd work on trying to be faster with my hands. If I want faster hand speed, to me, that's better body mechanics. Is my stance where it belongs the whole time? Is my hand where it belongs? Am I throwing a shot that is literally straight towards my target? That doesn't mean I move in. There's a lot of times I move laterally and fire towards or even the opposite direction. But my weapon travels in a straight line wherever it's going. So Branis does a shot, which is really cool. And everybody's like, Ooh, and I'm like, you know, he's just throwing an offside. That's all. That's just a basic offside. <laughs> we talk about, so you if your hands in the center and you throw a straight shot, right. You, you tend to throw this way. You're going to throw it to the onside. You're going to throw this way offside. You're going to throw it. So basically the shots are almost identical. Mm -hmm. So Branis does this one. It's hard to do with this little screen, right? But he does one where the hand rises, it drops and it rolls around and he tucks under and boom, he catches the leg or the body or the arm or whatever he wants on the offside, right? And then he slides off and everybody's like, whoa, all of this stuff, this was sleight of hand. That's what this was. This was, here I come, I'm going to crush you in the head. And they go, woo, they go flying up in the air. And then after doing all this, he puts his hand right back where it belongs. He leans over and just throws a straight shot. Boop. <laughs> so literally all he's throwing is this. It's just this simple straight offside shot. There's nothing special, but there's all this other part, right? And mm -hmm. I've done the one where I, you know, the one that everybody talks about from the one heroics where I rolled underneath and, and threw right. that shot. It's, the shot that made you a rock star. Right, exactly, right. <laughs> that was amazing. You know what was amazing is that I took the time. Look at how long that fight was. I threw four shots in that whole fight. The reason I could throw that amazing shot was because I did everything else. And I'll tell you right now, it wasn't like I, I went out and got, thought, you know what, this is going to be badass. I'm going to throw this wicked ass offside and I'm going to totally set it up. No. Um, Duke, forgive me, I'm forgetting his name now. You from the oh, east. I know. I apologize. Yeah, it's gonna have to come to me. He was such a nice guy. It was yeah, so sad that we probably. lost him. Yeah. Um, great guy, left-handed fighter. That fight took so long because I had to test and poke. And I figured out that he had these his movements were so tiny that it took me a while to figure out which ones I needed to stack. So I had to figure out this was his speed, this was his favorite shot. This was how he moved his shield for this particular threat. This combination of things will allow me to move to this location and throw this shot. That's when I knew what to throw. Okay. And then you executed. And then I executed it, right? Yeah, and I went, it was all set up in your head earlier. And it had to be built, right? Yep. I had to pull the information from him. And that's why if you ever watch that fight, 
you want to see the best part of that fight? It's not that shot. That shot is, and, and Bronis was the first one to start saying this, your shot, your shot is when the fight's over. That's when you, that's when you hit somebody. We all do the test shots and the people that keep their timing on or to pull their arms down and stuff like that. But when you actually throw to wound or kill an opponent, you better already know the fight's over. That's all that's for. It's like, oh, okay, I figured out what it takes to end this fight. Now I'm going to throw my shot. What you're talking about is low risk. You don't want to engage Always. in a yeah. risky exchange. You want to you want to set things up so you know what's going to come out. You're yeah. not a gambler. You that's just the, Yes, and that's the risk. Bring it back to speed. That's the risk of speed. That's speed correct. is about gambling. You want to quick draw somebody and you're faster? I'll tell you what. If you're faster, you will beat more people if it's only speed against speed. Mm -hmm. Okay? But you won't know which ones until you throw. All yeah, right? that, that's the gamble you right not there. know. So yep. I'm going to throw my speed out and hope that I'm faster. Really? Wouldn't you rather know what you're up against? You know, this brings me up to a, a great quote from Wyatt Earp. He says, he said, fast is yeah. fine, but accuracy is final. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very that's well done. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. He said, you must learn to... Uh, I'm going to bring this up just to make sure I don't misquote it. He says, you must learn to be slow in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to me, man, be calm. Don't, don't waste time, but don't rush yourself either. Because when you rush, you screw things up and they don't go right. And, you, and in his case, in a gunfight, you miss. He'd rather have the one shot that finishes it that's a half second behind his opponent because he stayed calm, he took his shot, and he hit what he was aiming at. And I thought that was a really profound viewpoint on speed. And I'm I sure gun fighters were, were pursuing like high, you know, they were scrambling and get to speed and they got caught up in their holsters and they were shooting their feet. All of it. Yep. All of that stuff. So, I, you know, in that fight we did, his grace Ron Valder was talking about uh, against Kendrick, who was an incredible, Thank you. incredible, incredible fighter. Um, there was a lot going on. They were both processing. They're both going through all of those pieces to figure out how to throw the final shot so yeah there's there's fast right and and there's uh, how fast the sword comes out but there's you know you you take that shot that everybody thought was incredibly fast there was a whole fight that uh, that his grace was building for that one shot so you know be careful what you think fast is you know it, there's there's the fast decision makings but sometimes there's that you know masashi's war happening before that he's building a battle Mm -hmm. And he's laying down, you know, this is that chess game people talk about. He's laying down and building all his moves to create the one final thing that with execution. Mm -hmm. If you're just going straight to execution, you, you better be very careful. Because now, like we were just talking about, it's a gunfight. It's a crapshoot. You got it. Because you, yeah. you're not controlling your opponent. You're not, you know, you're, you're not building a shot that will be good. Um, and I think that's critical, uh, you know, and, and we don't go out there to gamble it. This is really for a fight for you know, something. The, the idea is we don't go out there and gamble. I, I tell people all the time, I win a lot of fights, not because necessarily faster than people or, or even better than some people. There's a lot of people out there probably better than I am, but on average, my, <laughs> <laughs> uh, on average, my consistency is very high. <laughs> So, uh, but, uh, you know, that's, I, I think that's, you know, I, I like Tristan, like Ron Galder. I, I really, Tristan shared that, that the, those pieces of speed with me. And I really wanted, I was glad you got to that. And then you stole my thunder about Lomachenko and, and all of <laughs> yeah. that, you know, uh, it's I've one been of doing a few times I could steal any of Brown's yeah. thunder, so I got to get it while it comes. So, so along with, I think some of that is there's a timing that you create also allows you to be fast to an opponent and There's, some go ahead i was gonna say something that's, uh, that's always been frustrating to me is uh like the rest of us i love watching fight videos and stuff like that but i get frustrated and i've often shut them off prematurely even when the fighters are good when i watch two fighters especially belted ones who come out and i can tell that they've got experience and technique and then they walk up into each other and try to outshoot each other i'm like wow that is so frustrating to see. Yeah. Now that said, 
there's a lesson we were talking earlier, you guys were talking earlier about coaching in particular, there was a lesson I had to learn and it comes, this triggered it, uh, was because I read people, I learned that I can, in a fighter early on, I can tell kind of what their potential is, kind of how far they're capable of going. So I can see them being sometimes really, really good. And I've tried to help those people and I get frustrated when they don't listen to me. I'm, I worked really hard at this. This is something I'm good at. I'm giving you free information to be better. And you know, who's, who had a problem? It was me. I was the one who had a problem because sometimes as coaches, you have to know there are some fighters who just want to fight for fun. They, they're not here to become technical experts. They love the, just the joy of flailing away at an opponent, and that's a joy. And you know what? That's perfectly cool. I, once I figured out, I was very disappointed in myself that I realized there had been many people over the years where I had done this and gotten frustrated and finally realized, you know what? I'm screwing up their fun. So as coaches, we need to understand that there's some people – they don't want to get better. They're happy with where they are. They truly, as I say, they are truly happy with their prowess. They don't care about it. They're having a good time. Don't take that away from them. Let them have it. Use your time. You find somebody who does want to hear. Yeah. So, do we get any questions, Fest? Uh, yeah, that's. I was going to say we got about ten minutes. Yes. Um, so let's uh, let's kind of jump in if there's some questions that we let's try to make them relatively short answers, and uh, we will try to answer even more on the on the web page when we're there. I, I, Ron Galder uh, watches that page here and there too, so I'm yeah. sure he'll peek, he'll jump in there and add some stuff. Um, but do we have any questions, Vesper? We do. All um, right. All right. So there are two questions that are going to kind of combine into one. Um, the first of the two is in a time of social distancing, are there things that um, you would suggest people could do to practice timing without a sparring partner? And also along those lines, are there a couple drills you can recommend to train timing your opponent, changing tempo, reading your opponent, and disguising telegraphing? So I'd, I'd like to cover the, the, the creating the tempo and watching that tempo piece with a drill that can be done there. Um, uh, you know, the, the speed timing, speed is also a scenario where the smoother you make a shot, the better it is. In other words, take some video of yourself doing a shot and make sure your hand is always coming the exact same way. The more you can perfect a throw, and let's make sure that throw is good. This is back in another video we talked about. You can do pell work and, you know, 10,000 bad shots uh, is still a bad shot and you just learned it really well. Um, <laughs> so, so be careful, but you know, share it with somebody. If it's the right shot, the more you do it, the more you can relax when you throw it, the faster it looks to your opponent. So repetitive, repetitive drill at the Pell will help that. And it doesn't have to be a drill with a rattan sword. We do a, I do a lot of stuff with foam and that allows us to relax a little bit and then We'll do about one third or even a quarter with rattan just to make sure that that same feel and you understand that that shot looks the same. Uh, as far as building that timing, and this is a drill I actually have a number of people doing uh, because there's you know a pair of fighters in a household sometimes, uh, and and sometimes that's difficult to actually spar constantly in that scenario. In fact, most of the times it's very difficult to spar in that scenario without that emotion. But what what I've been having them do is. We go from the Pell, and, and well, I have a video coming up to talk about this, and that is you do your Pell drills, and then you do those exact same drills on a person that's moving forward and backwards in front of you, and they control that pace. So while you're walking at them, you're throwing that exact same blow because what's happening is you have to get range and feet all set up and your hips set up, and there's timing when you're moving. Many people, it's super easy to throw a blow when your feet are dug into the ground and ready to throw. Try to do that when you're on the move. So this helps you build that timing back and forth with each shot that you're learning. And then you break that out and allow them to, to do any angle. 
And, and this is what a lot of people call the dance, you know, or it, it, that's a drill by itself. You make that connection and then they go side to side and you slide side to side with them and throwing the same thing. And the more you can build your, your hand technique and precision, the, the better that, that speed looks, the more you build that timing into your body and hands and feet, the more that timing is built, the more power that can generate from the ground because your timing is better. That timing is sharper all the time and you end up with a shot that, that flows out of you the way it should and it looks fast. And, and really that's the fight. And you can change that speed now. You have total control over some of that. Um, so uh, it, what I would say is start on the Pell. If you have somebody to fight, I actually do it with boxing hand pads. I have somebody hold, you don't even need a fighter. They just hold it and walk backwards and I'll just constantly throw at that hand pad as I'm going forward, falling forward, throwing at that hand pad. And then they'll come at me and I'll throw and keep my distance and going backwards. And then they'll just, they'll just roll around and, and I'll throw and walk with them and, and throw and try to keep that exact same range. And then they, they can build that pace so it becomes more and more comfortable. And then decision making is faster, you know, initiation is faster. All of those things start feeding into that. And it's all Pell work. Just you have one standard still Pell, and now you have a moving Pell that's a friend just holding a pad out. So that's that's one way you can do it right now. And I, we've been doing a ton of that right now. Uh, and and we, you know, we, I have uh, lucky enough to have two other fighters that uh, we kind of stayed as a group, so uh, we get to train. But we do mostly a lot of that work, and it's great for people that are brand new because now you're building technique first before you're building a fight. The fight's important too, because there's timing you're learning, but now you're learning feet time, throw time, even before, as soon as that guy's moving all around, you're in a fight. The other guy's just not throwing at you. So it makes that transition so much simpler when you actually end up in a fight. So I'd like to jump in too and, and say one of the things that you can do, and most people that are watching this are watching on a computer. And I'm sure a lot of you have learned to type one of the, most distinctive ways that I've seen people build speed, for example, either with typing or with a 10 keypad, you don't start learning to type by just doing this on the keyboard really fast and then hoping you hit the right keys. Like that's a disaster, but that's exactly the way people approach learning to fight fast. They just say, I'm going to go as fast as I can. And then let's just see what happens. When you, when you learn to type really most of the work that's going on is in the synapse pathways of your brain. When you sit down to type and and if you were like i was many years ago this was probably back in the 80s and i was like hunt and peck thing and this is where i was trying to build my perception speed with my decision speed to my initiation speed to my performance speed and i was pounding on the on the keyboard one one finger at a time and then i realized that's just way too slow this is not going anywhere and then i realized okay i need to set both hands on the keyboard and each finger goes to certain keys but you do it just as slowly as your brain can comprehend it. And then you realize as you do it, you start getting used to it and your fingers start going a little quicker. You keep your eye on your error rate. Make sure that you're, you're hitting the right keys and you, the speed will come. So as you do any exercise, focus on your form first. Let the speed come in time. It will come just as you get more naturally comfortable with it. And if you've seen anybody work a 10 keypad, they're just, they can sit and chat and they'll be moving papers and their fingers are going on a 10 keypad like it's blazing on fire. You don't get to that speed by just moving your fingers around and hoping you hit the right numbers. And what I've found is that whether it's traditional martial arts or, or SCA fighting, use the same process. Go only as fast as you can do it well. And if you're, you know, a smart enough fighter where you can understand where your hips are turning, where you've stepped in the right place, you've got enough hip movement where you can execute and throw a shot with the, with, through the hips, through the shoulder. Do those things as well as you can do them at the speed you can do them. And the speed will come naturally. Just let it, let it actually come at, at its own pace. Be patient and don't try to rush it. And the other thing that I would say is, you know, when they asked Michelangelo about how do you take a big chunk of marble and make it into a beautiful statue. He says, I just start with a big chunk of marble and I remove everything that's not the statue. When we learn to, th to throw shots, we learn to do our form 
often we take the same approach. We throw all this muscle towards everything that we think needs muscle. And then we find out that that's inefficient. We start shutting down muscles that aren't needed until we eventually find that really efficient shot that only needs a little bit of muscle, a little bit of structure behind it, the right base, the right footwork, the right hip movement. But you carve away all the stuff that doesn't need to be there. You can, I don't want to say shortcut, but you can find a more direct path in. Don't look at how much muscle you can throw into your shot to make it work or how much energy you can throw in. Think of backing the, the muscle and energy back down. How little can you use to make that shot happen? When you're not getting in your own way, you become more fluid. With more fluid, you become smoother. And with smoother, you become faster. When right. so, a few as, as they ago, say in knife fighting, slow is smooth and smooth yeah. is fast. Yeah. Uh, several years ago, we had, uh, I didn't remember who she was. Somebody brought their daughter or sister or something. She was 13, 13 year old girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was watching and she was interested and she wasn't going to be, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't remember all the details around it. It was something about, she was like, that was like the only day she was visiting, whatever it was. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but she was interested. So I thought I'll have her throw a shot, teach her how to throw a shot. I taught a 13 year old girl to hit in our calibration level. Okay. So this isn't about strength. Uh, there are many fighters, um, any who are listening that I've that I've worked with, who have felt like things are difficult. And what I've had them do is exactly what what Tristan is talk about, and that is back out all those other muscles. What you're going to do is you're going to throw relaxed and fast with no strength. Okay, none, just smooth and fast in your mechanics as fast as you can, but no power, no power. And they would hit like a truck, and they're like. And you ask, well, how'd that feel? He said, well, it was easy. It wasn't very hard. It was, it had no power. I said, no, you're mistaken. It had exceptional power and you can see it. And then after a few, they realize if I work less, I get more power, which makes no sense to our brains. And it's frustrating to hear, but they just did it. Okay. So that's, that's what Tristan saw. I wrote a couple quick notes. So do I have time to run through these? Yeah, we're sure. going to wrap up with like probably one more question after this and then do a wrap up. Uh, we're just okay. running right on time now. This is being recorded so it can play later. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and okay. it would be playing later. And we'll have a right. section up where people can ask That's questions cool. too. That's cool. Because I, I made some notes. So I'm going to run through them fairly quick. If you don't okay. catch them, watch the video later. No, please do. So I just wrote them real quick. So they might even be in a weird order. So... We we're talking about how to learn some of this when uh, 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 learning how to respond. So the one that came to mind is we had a drill we did with a pole arm, which made me chuckle because it's usually six feet long and we need six foot distancing, right? Um, you'd, you'd rest it in your belly, usually just below your belly button, and you put your hands underneath it. You don't hold on to it. You just let it rest in your palms against your belly button. Your partner like Bronze was saying, your dance partner holds the other end against their belly. And one of you moves forward, backwards, left and right, changing timing and start out really slow. Like Tristan said, you do it slow first, as, as fast as your body will allow. And you will find it will be very slow. What you're doing is you're feeling each other push. And the, the reason the pole is there is the slightest movement, you will feel the push or the pole arms begin to fall away from you. And your goal is to maintain that consistent contact. You'll find you can read somebody, you're getting very quick feedback with that pole arm. Um, another one was how to do some of this when, um, when we don't have partners, we don't have practice, what can we be doing? Uh, a couple that I do is, like I talk about, uh, your body mechanics are a priority. To me, they're everything. If, my, if I do everything right with my body, I can do an awful lot externally. If I fail at those, that's when I die. So some of the things I do when I'm not at practice are one of them is walking, how I walk. Um, when I walk, I'll use my stair example. If you guys want more of these, let me know, but I'll use my stair example. When you go downstairs, 95% of people, when you go down, 
It's a thump, 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 thump. The reason for that is it's a controlled fall. That's how we all go downstairs, right? You lean forward, you bend your knee, and the next foot hits, thunk. You lean, thunk, you lean, thunk. What I do is I sit down and I set my foot on the next step and then I shift my weight, okay? So my body is in my control. So if there's a step that's out, it doesn't matter. I, I had to touch it. When the ground is uneven, like at Penzik, I will walk with my hips lower and walk like this because the uneven ground I can respond to before I shift my weight. Okay, that's when you get people to hurt themselves. They step expecting a certain depth. It's not there. And then there's an impact because they limit straight. The weight's already on it. So how I walk. The other one is driving. Okay, when you're driving, typically it's 10 and 2, right? For us, that's A-frame. Okay, so I will let go with one hand. Keep My eyes are on the road, so I don't have to change anything. And I work on this motion, pushing forward slowly. Like Tristan said, slow. And I do it extremely slow because I'm trying to feel every part of my upper torso as I push the shot out driving. It's not risky because my eyes are on the road and I always have a hand on the wheel. Okay. But it allows me to, to work on this throwing shots left or right handed. Um, mirrors. Brown has talked about having somebody pay attention, uh, somebody give you feedback, videotape. If for some reason you can't do that or it's, it's two in the morning. It's like, oh my God, I want to work on this thing I learned. So do it. Do it in front of a mirror. Watch how you move. Okay. That, the uh, beauty of a mirror, by the way, is you get immediate feedback. You don't have yes. to go and look at the video afterwards and get feedback. You get it instantaneously. Yes. You can make the correction right there. And that, that practice becomes a correct one. Uh, like Brian has said with throwing a bunch of shots. These people throw a thousand shots a day. Uh, that's impressive to me, but also sad are you telling me you're throwing a thousand good shots or you're throwing a thousand shots? I would rather you throw 50 or even 30. Five, even five. five hell yeah. Shots. Five perfect shots. And if they are this slow and every bit of you is right where it belongs, I'm excited for you yep. because that's you get far, your bot farther than doing 5,000 shots that are screwed up. Yep. Otherwise you're back to that other guy. <laughs> a gentleman, and I can't remember who it was now, was put out a video. He had I think taped a ball on a string. So he was doing the boxing thing where he'd push it and he'd set. And when the ball came, he'd slip it and then throw around it and let it come by. He'd slip it. He'd come back and then he'd slip and let it pass by him. Okay. And somebody was like, well, that's really slow. People don't throw that slow. Well, that's what we're talking about. You do it's not the point. Tristan just told you do it slow, get what your body's doing. Then in a fight, when something comes at him, his instinct is to slide it. He's right. taught himself to. Okay. You know, and this is a phrase that, that I've come back to time and time again. If you can't do it slow, you can't do it fast. Yes. Yep. Period. Yep. Uh, Tristan had said something about, about how your muscles learned it. I just call it muscle memory. The path that your body follows is what your body will remember. Your muscles have no concept of time. They have a concept of space. All right. So when you're on that pal, that's why that five shots is important. You throw them exactly right. Your body remembers the path. That's the path it will follow when you accelerate it or decelerate it. It'll follow that. Same. If you go a thousand times, you very quickly taught it a poor path. And that's the path it's going to follow no matter what speed you go at. And I think that hit everything in my note. <laughs> uh, so I believe there's, you know, we're going to, we're kind of running away against the window. Uh, we're going to just do one last question, I believe, uh, with somebody posted uh, over here, and we'll try to wrap it up quick with that one. Uh, we do appreciate everybody's uh, interest, and uh, we apologize for running a little bit late, but uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we promise to come back with some more stuff, but what's the last uh, question we got there? All right. The last question, in your opinion, what is the ideal amount of time to train as to not suffer information overload? Well, information overload for to me, information overload. Uh, I do it to people all the time. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I, I follow the I uh, the the kind of wet paper towel against the fence idea, uh, where I throw lots of stuff at people. At the end, I usually say, pick two things and do them. Um, but the idea is that the more they hear it, the more likely they're at some point ready to hear it again and learn it. Um, so there's some prep. Not everybody's gonna gonna know. Uh, if you jump into the deep end of the pool, they may not know how to swim. 
but at some point they get farther and farther in that pool and you can kind of find when those times are right to give that information to them when they really going to understand it but if they in the beginning if you never tell them this and they just had this happen to me not too long ago they're like well that's not necessarily what you said before and i'm like well it, it isn't because we had to go through a progress to get somewhere where you're ready to take that information and now use it so so uh you know as far as information overload you just have to watch you know you'll, you'll see i i have I have lots of nights that look after me after five minutes of talking to like, I'm going to go sit down and process all that because I, I am done. <laughs> so just be careful. And, and if you see a person going off that edge where they, they get glazy eyed, bring them back to the one thing you think, and this is what a good coach does. Bring them back to the one thing you think they really captured and really want to work on. That makes me think of the, the probably one of the most important things I'm going to say it's one of the most important things about coaching because I had to learn it and it bothers me that I didn't recognize it and that is the priority when you're coaching is not you okay I went through a period where I could feel my ego being fed by instructing people and I found in retrospect, there were times that I taught people because it, it was felt good for me. Well, I got this thing that I know that you don't know, except all that does is make me look stupid and nobody gets anything out of it. It's a waste of time. What I have found has been far more rewarding is pay attention to the person, ask them questions. If you don't, as a coach, if you don't have the answer, that means you haven't asked all the right questions. It's the same thing with reading an opponent. You need, to, you need to ask more questions to get more information before you can attack them. With a student, you need to ask more questions until you figure out what is they're actually looking for. Like our speed thing here, it's exactly what we've done. People have come to us and said, we wanna be faster, we need more speed. Do you really? Let's ask you some questions. And the five things that Tristan listed are perfect place to start with those questions. So as an instructor, pay attention to what your student needs, even if you're only talking to him once, he's still your student that, at that point, and watch how they respond. Are they getting it? Do you need to describe it a different way? Have you maxed out? Because that's me. Like Bronis and I, we get excited. We see the, the potential in an individual. So we're like, I know if I give you all of these things, you'll be spectacular, except you, all you do is you crush them with that and they don't get any of them. So for, my, for, for me personally, I typically, watch myself when i start getting to about three things for somebody i'm at maximum they're not going to get them all and then i do exactly what Brana says i come back around and when i finish with them typically what i do is i say okay now tell me what tell me what the things are what is it that you're going to be working on and i have them repeat it back to me because it doesn't matter if i understand it it matters if they do and if they can tell me that's helpful yeah, and my experience too is when I get a student that comes into the dojo and I see that same potential or I see where they're at and the first trap that I fell into as an instructor, and I did this in the SCA too, uh, was, boy, I wanted them to be as good as I was or better. And I'm like, let me just give you everything. I'm just going to brain dump everything on you. And really, and, and it, it took me to getting into the martial, traditional martial arts to hear this phrase, and I think this fits perfectly, is it's like trying to drink from a fire hose. Yeah. You will absolutely flood somebody with water and they can't, they can't drink any of it because it's just, it's absolutely overwhelming. Yep. And, and I, and I found the same conclusion, look and listen as a good instructor, a good teacher will to what the next thing is that they're ready for and give them those just one or two, maybe three things make it in edible chunks, give them a cup of water. Don't just point a fire hose at their face and let her rip. Yeah. And uh, when that happens, you need to have a certain amount of patience and being an assertive person, I tend to, you know, jump into things kind of feet first. But what I found is measure, take good measure and feed them what they need to grow rather than just absolutely drowning them with more information they can do. And I, I wish I had a nickel for every night and every, experienced fighter that I've seen out of the goodness of their heart, they want to transfer everything that they know. And that's noble, but it still doesn't make the bottleneck any wider of how much information that can be conveyed in a single 
session or in, or in a five minutes or in an hour, uh, it, you, you, you get to that point. And a good instructor will start to see the eyes start to spin as people's, their brains are filled up and they need yep. processing time. Yeah. Everybody's so, brain has only a certain amount that it could take in, just like you say. It think does. Like, There's an yeah. absorption. And the more we push in, the, they get tinier pieces of all those things. Now, from a student's point of view, one way you can change that sum is some very simple things that have little and everything to do with fighting. Make sure you get enough sleep, enough water, enough salt, enough of the right foods, you know, eat your come with, come with an empty protein. Cup. No. Yeah. Come, come and, and be willing to listen. You know, if you fill it up ahead of time with, well, I already know this thing. Excellent. Cause that means you're not going to learn anything. You're done. You know, you think you know everything, then you do you're, you're maxed out. So pay, be open to hearing what they say. Even I learned as I was learning when somebody would teach me something that went against the, the teaching that I was learning at my practice and that we were doing, it was still beneficial because I would strive to understand what they were doing, see what it felt like. And every now and then I can incorporate it. Or if it didn't incorporate it, I learned somebody else's way of thinking about something. And that's advantageous too. Yeah. Just like if say sword and shields, your weapon style, and you never want to fight polearm. But if you go fight some polearm, you'll be much better fighting against a polearm. Mm -hmm. So understand somebody, even when they don't, they don't talk about what, your learning is they the coach didn't get it yeah i think that's a good one so and from us from a student standpoint if i want to jump into because i'm sure yeah. everybody every fighter's had this where they're surrounded by three or four knights who's just flooding them everybody's got their own opinion here's what <laughs> you, gotta do. you gotta do this no you gotta do that it i i hereby grant you permission pick <laughs> one or two things that stick in your mind as being you know that makes sense to me and just go work on those don't try to process everything or you'll get nothing. So yep, absolutely. Pick, pick your best and go with that. And in the end, just, you know, be open with the person coaching you. I've, I've had a lot of people and, and they be like, okay, I am kind of at maximum load. And I'm like, great. Now let's just talk about the things that you really want to learn out of this. Like Ron Golder was saying. And then we just review that. We make sure that each other, that, that he knows exactly what we're talking about. And then we move on. And he goes and does his thing. A lot of times I'll bring over another person that's from his practice so that they can watch each other and help each other. That way, if two people know it, the better, the better you, the chance you have of learning that. So it's that so cool even... when you give them that one thing, they grow from it and they get so excited that the next time they see you, whether it's months or a year or weeks, and they come back and they're like, I'm doing the thing. I'm ready for another yes. thing. Yeah, you... exactly. One or two things. And, and they will... Oh, they, it's, that's so satisfying. All right, guys, uh, I'm sure there's probably lots more questions out there. We're going to collect them um, out of the Facebook stuff. Uh, I'm going to beg and, and plead with Best Bar, who is so good to us. It's amazing. Thank you again for Thank helping you, us Bar. and hosting She's been this. very patient through all of this. I Let know. Just she has to sit away. here and listen to us. It's terrible. Uh, she, didn't, got... she didn't even roll her eyes once. I, oh, oh, no, I'm sure. <laughs> On the inside, maybe. You know me too well. <laughs> well, I got one last question uh, before we kind of wrap this up, and I'll, I'll throw that. It's a real quick question but um i'd like to first thank everybody uh we'll be back uh please come out to coach's corner we'll, we'll like i said we'll have a post out there love to talk to people we'll I'll, I'll post up some lomachenko videos out there so people can see what what kind of stuff he does uh and uh and then i have a couple other videos that i had some of my guys shoot uh on on quicker feet quicker you know quicker hands all that kind of a little bit of those have been good videos like that. yeah so uh we'll post some of those up and uh and we'll take some questions and um you know hopefully we'll we'll really have a good conversation in that one and we'll try to keep doing that on each one of our episodes where can people find this this is at sca it's a facebook group called sca coaches corner so. uh, we will put a link up on this group page tonight just to wrap up the episodes of people you know, need easy access to come find you. They know exactly where to go to ask you their burning questions. Excellent. As we suspected, the topic of speed, I think we've opened the Pandora's box because yes. we, we listed out about four questions that I think most people have. We just covered one of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so we, we took two hours to We're going to come back, it. I think, with a second episode here, and we're going to cover some of the more, some of the other questions that listeners have, as well as the, the basic uh, topics that, that, 
we think are going to be on everybody's mind. It certainly was on my mind as I developed as an unbelt and even into it being a knight about like, how do I deal with this speed problem? Um, I think we've taken a whole new way to look at this and really define it. So I like the idea that there's going to be a second one and this will give people time to think about what speed really is for them and have good questions for next time too. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you again, Ron Valder, for joining. Thanks for having yeah, me, guys. I had a great time. That, I, I, it's I appreciate good to it. see your face. I mean, it's, it's been great a, to see you way again. too long, brother. And my long hair. Oh, I know, man. Look at, <laughs> look at this. I think I got grayer. Yeah. So, so my last question, uh, this one, you know, Vespar's always asking us fun questions, and she didn't get to answer, ask questions today, thank and God. I'm sure she misses <laughs> it. <laughs> So I'm going to ask her a question. Oh, no. Oh, did you get that? <laughs> nice. Hell yeah. I love it. Ah, she, has I love it. she has a big old pal in that backyard. Yeah. Oh, no. I know. Oh, okay. she, she didn't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Since she always puts us, I thought I'd, I'd just strike back. And, and I love her. Vesper, will you do us a favor? Yes. Tomorrow, five. Five good shots on the pal tomorrow. You got it. I'll do it. Okay. All Just right. Make, all make, I'm asking is five. Good make ones. each and shot take at least ten full seconds. Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. That's not a joke. He's totally That's not serious. a joke. I'm not no, kidding. He's not joking at all. Yep. I, I did find, and I've mentioned this. I think um, why I spoke to His Grace Bronos about this before. Uh, you know, practicing slowly is super important. Obviously, my problem was that I only did that. And when I was asked to amp up the speed, it felt completely foreign to me and kind of freaked me out because I just, <laughs> I, I hadn't really practiced that way either. Um, so, but you got it, five shots, five really good shots, 10 seconds each tomorrow. I'll do By it. By the way, I, I, wanna, I wanna jump in here because this is something I learned from a mentor of mine that talked about uh, physical conditioning. If you really wanna find out where you're weak, say for example, for a squat, do a squat, even just a body weight squat and do it like super slow, molasses in January slow. What'll happen is as, you, as your body starts to lower, when you, when you see your knees start to come in or they start to shake, it's that point through the range of motion that's weak. Hold it right there for about five seconds and then keep going. Do what's Only most when miserable. You do it that slow, <laughs> will, you, will your body tell you where you're weak exactly? Like when you do something slow, the feedback you get is profound. It will tell you where your alignment's off, where your strength is off, where your body mechanics are off. But if you go fast, you'll never hear that. You'll never comprehend where your body is off or where things are missing. And you'll just keep going faster and trying to overcome the poor form with speed. And it never works. Well, thank all you. Right. Thank, thank you for you. all of your time tonight. Thank um, you, everybody. My yeah. Honor. yeah. Thanks to our viewers, too. Right? Yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah. They, they hung in there. <laughs> I have respect for that. Well, we will put up a link to the Coach's Corner. Um, and that will be accessible to everybody that's been watching tonight. If you have more questions, feel free to Thanks pop over there. Thanks for doing all that, Vesper. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you again, Vesper, awesome. and thank, thank you, Ron Paul, for joining us. It was tonight. great yeah. to see you guys. Love you, brothers. We're counting all on right. you to come back for number two. Uh, if you want me to, I'll do that. Yeah, that would be great. Of course. Okay. Perfect. Cool. All, all right. right. And, and maybe what plan. we can do is, is uh, build, uh, I'm sure Sean's brain is ready to explode. Not oh, being I'm on sure. this expo, so <laughs> we will drag him in for the next there one. There we too. go. But we'll keep him on mute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. All right. Take take so, care, guys. All righty. Yeah. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.